But yeah, we're now live on Facebook. Um, this this month's uh, book draw is for Alistair's Forgotten Highlander. Uh, Keith and I met Alistair 2006 at the Great Yarmouth uh, Feeble Day gathering. Um, he came all the way from Scotland to be with us, um, which was brilliant. Um, such a such a character, and he came in his Scottish trues. Uh, brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, I'll t I'll hand you over to Barbara to say a bit on the book. Okay, Barbara, over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the Forgotten Highlander. Well, I'd like to talk a bit about Alistair as the man, and um, of course he was born. He was born in 1919 in a small fishing village, which is called Newton Hill, which is a parish of Buckney in Scotland. But after four years, um, they moved out to Aberdeen, and um, uh, he had his usual time at school, being a very enthusiastic um, little sports player, and um, he loved to be a member of the Scouts as well. Um, so he did really well at school. But uh, when he was 15, his family um, unfortunately fell into uh, financial difficulties. I think it was around that time when um, there was a lot of um, problems with the uh, boom and bust thing that we've seen here, but uh, it was even worse for them then. Um, so he was told really that he'd uh, got to leave school. So he volunteered and said, yes, okay, um, because of his father's financial problems. And he went to work as an office boy at a plumber's merchants. And he worked his way up, eventually being promoted to the showrooms and becoming a trainee warehouseman. And he was a keen member of the Scouts and he played football, he did gymnastics and, you know, was an all round good kid, really. Um, but on Sunday, the 3rd of September 1939, a very important day, he was called um, up to the MD's office and told to go home. And he said, well, why? And they said, well, didn't you know? War has broken out. So off he went home and pretty soon after that his life changed because he was conscripted into the Gordon Highlanders Regiment on the 23rd of September. And he left his life of comparative uh, comfort and moved to the basic hard training um, that is involved when you join the army. Then training done, he moved on uh, to be put on to standby to go out to the Far East and they were issued with tropical kit. The, I think the British Army tropical kit would have probably done them in the Arctic as well, but um, you know that was uh, our way mm -hmm. then. Uh, he had to travel in full Highland dress, so it was interesting to say that when you met him, uh, Ronnie and uh, Keith, he was wearing his trues. But when they travelled out to the Far East, they travelled in full Highland dress. So they had to travel down uh, to Dover in their full kit, sitting on their um, kit bags in third class. Uh, something which was, I think, pretty uncomfortable. And uh, they travelled off down through France to Marseille, where he embarked on the ship called the Andes, which took them all the way to Singapore, stopping at Port Side, through the Suez Canal, through the Red Sea, onto Aden, Calcutta, down the coast of the Malay Peninsula, dodging German submarines all the way. And then three weeks later, they landed in Singapore. They assembled on the promenade deck, in full Highland dress in 80 degree temperatures, which as Scotsmen, they were not used to, I shouldn't <laughs> think. And they soon realized how important it was to keep their heads and necks covered and probably their knees too. He moved uh, from there with them to Selerang, which was the Gordon Highlanders uh, barracks. And he's put a little interesting note in something I read where they were warned about where they went out in Singapore <laughs> as uh, sexually transmitted uh, diseases were rife. Yep. And if they came mm. back showing signs of that, they were going to be put on charge and severely dealt with. So once um, they were all about uh, having had that lecture and being frightened, I'm sure, uh, they were issued with their jungle kits and a substantial rifle, which had been made in 1907. So as you can imagine, it was already pretty well out of date. Mm and they were all pretty decrepit. So they lined up for an inspection and the whole lot of them failed. Six weeks of relentless training followed that in the intense heat. They also celebrated Christmas 
with a traditional fare, which they ate in 90 degrees, and he says that it doesn't, didn't feel right at all. <coughs> Being uh, the uh, Alistair that he was, he managed to find time for playing sport and socialising. Socialising, um, because of the warning, I think he uh, managed to find that it was nice just to go dancing, and dance halls were air-conditioned, so that had an attraction in those tropical heats. So they were then ordered up country to Port Dixon for jungle manoeuvres. And this is where uh, Alistair had quite a tough time because he fell into um, a bush of ants, red ants, and got badly bitten, bitten, which absolutely terrified him. Shortly after that, he was transferred to Fort Canning, which was a lot more comfortable. It was the headquarters of the general staff and also of the Royal Corps of Signals. It was very busy, though, because... Um, he comments that um, uh, he was doing a lot of typing and office work um, and the adjutant and the um, sergeant major were often missing and um, I think he discovered that they were both alcoholics and weren't fit for duty. He'd got a pal called Tommy and they used to go out dancing quite a lot and he actually won a competition and had, was pre presented with a small cup and a mantle clock which he you know, treasured quite a lot. Um, and he also started to get to give lessons to Chinese um, people there for which he got paid and which were a good um, booster to his pay. But things were getting tense and the mood of war was in the air. This was December 1941 and the code Matador was being used. Some of you might know about the code yeah. Matador. Yeah. And then on December the 8th, Pearl Harbour was um, bombed. Um, and war was declared on Japan. The strange thing that I discovered was that colonials um, living out in Singapore went very supportive of the troops and they were actually quite obstructive. They um, refused them to use civilian phone lines, which you know, uh, meant that they couldn't um, get in touch with the, the different um, places that they were um, situated. And the rail officials insisted that civilians got... Um, uh, right of way over um, uh, the, the uh, army staff, um, so it, it caused ca chaos. Often uh, Red Cross and hospital trains were shunted into sidings and uh, it really wasn't good. Anyway, hostilities, hostilities were hotting up and the Gordon Highlanders um, were worried that um, there was going to be more issues, which we know happened. Um, and Alistair um, was put in charge of three boy soldiers. Now, these, I found this really interesting because I hadn't heard of this. There were two brothers, age 14 and 15, and another young lad of 16. Uh, the two brothers were actually the sons of a Gordon Highlander, so I, I presume that's why they were there. Alistair was put in charge of looking after them, and there were air raids, lots and lots of air raids. And unfortunately, we had no fighter planes to fight them off. And the poor boys were terrified, so he put them in the barracks. EPO, there's that thing about, fell by Christmas and the Navy um, had the Prince of Wales and the Repulse sunk by kamikaze pilots. Both the army and the civilians were retreating um, down into uh, south into Singapore and it was a really desperate time. Alistair had got his own hot um, at the side of the reservoir and he was quite dismayed when that got bombed and he lost most of his personal belongings including his um, favourite record player in his records. Then the retreat happened on the midnight of 8th of February. What remained of the Argyll and Sutherlanders, uh, Sutherlanders and the Cordons escaped across the causeway to Singapore. It, he noted that some of the high ranking officers used Red Cross ambulances to make their escape and I think that didn't go down well. And then started the world's most uh, worst worst military campaign in, in history that uh, modern times was um, the battles that ensued up until the 15th and he noted that fine men died and Japan was able to bomb at will. Fort Canning <coughs> became the prime target and the ceasefire happened actually on the 14th of February and the Japanese entered Singapore on the 16th. He was in the march that uh, went 15 miles to Changi Garrison. They had no water on the way because of the shelling. But he was put in charge of the boys who refused the opportunity to go into civilian uh, 
clothing and uh, and not be captured with the soldiers but they said no they wanted to stay with them so Alistair was given the uh, job of looking after these boys and of educating them up to GCE standard work parties were going on for the rest of the troops but Alistair was uh, kept busy with the, the boys um, no one knew what the boys fate was going to be an interesting comment was that um, concert parties were held um, and it, this belies all the horror that you hear because he commented uh, in what I read that um, there was a violinist and playing the one night and he listened to Mendelssohn and Brooke, that's my favourite composer, in the moonlight, which must have been quite surreal when you've just been captured. Then the 1st of September uh, came the declaration that um, they, all the troops had got to sign the promise not to uh, escape. So that was the crush. And the men were dying that in there, in the, the sun in the day and the cold at night. And they sang Land of Hope and Glory to keep their spirits up. Eventually, as we know, they came to an agreement about the signing and um, that, that passed. But by that time, uh, while all of this was going on, uh, the men were suffering from dysentery, malaria, prickly heat, etc. They had very little food um, to feed 30,000 men. Um, so some was being stolen from the docks. And again, the officers were really not um, in, in favour because they were stealing tins of fruit and corned beef for themselves and not sharing it. The good news was that the boys passed their exams. Um, Alistair was able to keep in touch with the boys after the war, um, but um, Freddie lived with his, in, his time of being in prison literally in his head. He, he couldn't um, dissociate a lot of the time from reality. He still thought he was in captivity and then sadly he died at a very young age of alcoholism. Alistair, you know, was sent then up, up the railway. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to go into on this or whether somebody wants to come in. But, you know, they travelled up in the stifling heat after being promised, you know, that they were going on holiday, probably. They had one meal in 36 hours. Their next stop was Koala Lumpur, where they had plain rice and a cup of awful tea. Then on to Penang, where they had rice and stew. The men were all starving. They were ill and quite a lot of them died. Um, and then they passed into Thailand and came out at Bampong. Six days it had taken them to reach there and he commented that it was a Your pathetic sight is... to see men unable to walk, semi-conscious, starving, had dengue fever, Diastolic. dysentery, malaria and they had no medical supplies. They tried to make stretchers from bamboo poles with black blankets and rice sacks between the poles but none of them were fit enough actually to lift the men who were too ill to walk. Um, he was involved in Hellfire Pass, um, and as we know, they said 13,000 men died, one man for every uh, sleeper on the railway track. Having completed that, he uh, was shipped back down to Singapore and loaded onto a boat called the Kachidoki Maru um, to go to Japan. And this is quite an important part of his life because, uh, sadly, they were bombed by, uh, well, torpedoed by an American submarine. And he ended up drifting for five days on a raft. Uh, eventually they were picked up by a whaler and transferred to a labor camp in Japan, about 10 miles from Nagasaki. And I think it was the 9th of um, August, 1945, when what, what eventually led to his freedom happened. He, he heard a plane. And he knew that it wasn't a Japanese plane, it was an American plane. There was no opposition to the plane, uh, which seems strange. It wasn't being fired at. It droned overhead. And a few minutes later, he was blown across the pathway by a big gust of wind and very hot air. And that was the bomb going off. And the bomb saved their lives as had been a directive to massacre all the prisoners on the 12th of August if the Americans dared land on the Japanese territory. Alistair eventually returned to Aberdeen and the family were wonderful. But he had been so affected by what had happened to him, um, he, he couldn't cope with it. And he'd go out first thing in the morning, walk miles and miles, and sometimes even didn't come back till the next morning. He couldn't eat, he couldn't stay indoors, 
He had mood swings. He felt demoralised. I think that really signified what a lot of our, our poor FIPOs felt when they came back. Anyway, there was Mary, his sweetheart, who stood by him and they eventually married. But um, he couldn't sleep in the marital bed. He had awful nightmares and terrors. And one time he woke with his hands around her throat, which absolutely terrified him. But life settled down. He had his family and, you know, things were, were better. But then she died, Mary did, in 1993. And he wrote a brief sanitised memoir for his family of his experiences, which led on to this book that we're going to be giving uh, away in the draw today. Uh, in which she, you know, wrote about more. So whoever wins the book will find out in detail at hand. Alistair, after Mary had died, managed to look after himself until he reached the grand age of 96. And then he moved into a, a care home um, and he uh, finally passed away on the 7th of October 2016. The one thing about the book is that um, it, it received a great... Um, Welcome and Steven Spielberg. Apparently, his um, film company bought the rights to the book. I don't think anything ever has ever come to it, but um, I think there was a series um, that was made, and some of it was featured in that. Um, looking back, Al Alistair received an Outstanding Bravery Award on the 22nd of June 2007. I'm, I'm not sure why you got that. I'd like to think they should have all got that all those that came back, but maybe there's something specific, Ronnie, that you can tell me about. Um, there was also a time which I know, Ronnie, um, you've talked about, was that um, his, his daughter had moved to Canada, lived there, and in September 2008, Alistair went and visited his daughter, Joyce. She was living in Ontario, um, and they'd been invited to go down by Mary Michael, I think that's right, yep. Yep. Um, yep. to San Francisco where the submarine, the Pampanito, <laughs> is in dry docks. Um, and he went to visit it. Um, and I, I think, uh, Ronnie, you're going to be the best one to tell us what um, was actually said in there. Um, so that was great. Anyway, that's my, hopefully I haven't bored you too much, um, nope. explanation that, that, that was, of, that was great. Uh, of his life. OK, that so I'll great. pass over to you to fill yeah. us in the gaps that I've missed. That was great, Barbara. Uh, that thought that... <laughs> After 2007, when, well, 2006, when <clears throat> we actually met uh, Alistair, <clears throat> I did get in touch with him quite a bit, and I put together his story, which is in the Far Eastern Heroes. <clears throat> and we said we'd follow up with part two, but part two became his book. So we never did do part two on the, on the uh, Far Eastern Heroes that, because his book came out. But um, one great thing, Mary uh, from uh, America, she got in touch and she said uh, she made an appointment for Alistair to go and see the submarine. And uh, one of the crew members uh, said, uh, why is he coming over? Is he still angry with us? <laughs> I, just, I, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> but Alistair was, uh, he was such a character. He was, a, he was really a, a lovely chap. Um, you couldn't get annoyed with him at all because he, he tried so hard. But the award was for everything he had done in the war, of course. And uh, although we've had this set out before, Bernard, he did go around schools and the award was to keep the candle burning type of thing. Mm. He went around to schools and he did talk to the school children about his war efforts. OK, so that was really what it was about. And if you have a look at the Far Eastern Heroes, that does show him dancing. He was a great dancer. He loved his dancing. But uh, anyway, we'll go on to the draw. OK. Um, right, you should see the draw on screen. I have altered it slightly mm -hmm. so it's more presentable to what we're doing. OK, so the first one, um, Matt, would you like to make a note of the name? 
Have you got a pen? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. If you'd like to make a note of the name, I'll, I'll send the address later. But here we go with the draw. Right, Melanie Woolham. Okay, Melanie that's Woolham. the. Yeah. Yeah, we've got two. <coughs> one, one is uh, you've got Matt. And uh, the I other have, you've got one as I well. Have. The other one I have, I had a spare one, so this one is gone as well. So the second person will be. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it will be. Yeah. Michael Clancy. Yeah, Michael Clancy will be the second one. Okay. Great. Stop sharing now. Okay. And uh, this, the draw is open to all the charity uh, family uh, members, uh, people family charity members. If you'd like to join, um, we, we we find you welcome. We have these video meetings twice a month, and uh, they're quite enjoyable. Uh, we you're only seeing a piece of it, but we do have quite a discussion about research and things. And it is if you don't like to attend the meetings, the the video is put on the secure pages just for the charity members, so you can watch it later. Okay, so I'll just. We'll end this now. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, later, I will put a video on which will be clearer than the one you've just watched.